virtually all the pharaohs of the 20th dynasty called themselves Ramses. Ramses was the son of Seti I and was born around 1302 BC. At the age of 14, he was appointed Prince Regent by his father. He's believed to have taken the throne in his early 20s and to have ruled between 1279 to 1213 BC. He would become the most prolific pharaoh to have lived, with many of his monuments still surviving today. These include the famous rock-cut temple at Abu Simbel, the stunning decorative hall in Karnak, and the mortuary temple, the Ra Museum, at Thebes. Even after thousands of years, the splendor of these sites still confounds modern architects and engineers. Ramses II was an ambitious ruler who wanted to seize new territories as well as protecting those he already held. His army had to be just as well armed as those of his aggressive neighbors. One of the first things that Ramesses had to do was to face a new threat to Egypt, and this was the Hittite Empire. There was a new emerging power in the Middle East, and they were attacking the boundaries of Egypt and disrupting the trade into Egypt. Under Ramses, Egypt began by capturing, then adapting its enemy's weapons. In 1720 BC, it was invaded by a warring people called the Hyksos. After defeating them, the Egyptians took their more advanced weapons and copied them. The princes from Thebes had driven out the Hyksos from Egypt, but they'd learnt by experience that they were able to adopt and adapt the weapons that had come into Egypt at this time. And from that point on, for a foreign foe approaching the Egyptian army, they knew they were facing the latest technology and the best weapons. One of the most dangerous weapons developed by the Egyptians was the penetrative axe. In the Cairo Museum is a spectacular example of a three and a half thousand year old ceremonial axe. The expertise of the weapon maker was so fine that it is still sharp today. The melding of different metals to make stronger weapons was the key factor. In Herefordshire, blacksmith Steve Blewett uses techniques unchanged for thousands of years. During the Egyptian period, new metal compounds were used in weaponry to make them stronger. Every small improvement gave the army an advantage. When we're reproducing things like this, the technology is exactly the same. We use open fires and molds. We're still discovering things that we've actually forgotten that they used over uh, 2,000 years ago. This is a bronze Egyptian penetrative axe. As far as we can gather, it probably would have been used on fleeing and wounded uh, opponents. The new, stronger, penetrative axe could inflict serious damage against most protection. This is bronze, which is a mixture of copper and tin, and bronze is actually three times harder than either of the parent metals. It's roughly between 9 and 10% tin, and the rest is copper. The forging of these metals is something that blacksmiths would struggle with today. Previous to that, they were only using copper, which could also be work-hardened, but it lost its edge a lot faster, and it, it didn't uh, cast so well as bronze. Some of the workmanship involved is, you know, we would struggle to do it today. The use of bronze ensured that the axe heads were stronger and would keep their sharp edges for longer. In the right hands, they were lethal. Egyptologists are now beginning to understand the advanced metallurgy behind weapon technology in Egyptian times. This is a replica of an ancient Egyptian battle axe, and it dates to the period of the New Kingdom, which is the time of Thutmose III and Ramesses II. Now, it's very easy to look at museum objects in glass cases and look at them as nice objects in their own right, but it's easy to forget this is a killing machine. It was designed to actually kill people. The copper or bronze blade is actually lashed to the handle uh, with leather thonging. Now, it may seem a very flimsy way of securing it, but the leather is put on when it's still untreated and it shrinks and tightens, and that's a really secure fixing. That means that soldiers can do their own maintenance. If, if they have a damaged handle, they can replace the handle and do it themselves. You don't need a big military workshop there. This long haft of the, the axe, it gives it a longer swing when you're using it. And this flared shape at the end, again, that's not just nice design. It's to stop the axe falling out of your hand uh, when you're using it, if you're hot and, and, and sweaty. But how powerful was the penetrative axe when used against an ancient helmet? 
Definitely a better strike than the mace. Almost managed to cleave the helmet. Right through inside, probably a fractured skull. Not a happy bunny. Did soldiers use body armor in battles? Because of the intense heat, most of the body was exposed to the force of bows and blades. Only occasionally were charioteers shown wearing leather bands around their bodies. However, the pharaoh had to be protected in battle. On this ornate chest, Tutankhamun is depicted wearing body armor. Ramses II would also go into battle wearing leather body armor. Yet the Hittites were more advanced, having developed flexible metal armor. This is a replica, this is a reconstruction which was done a few years ago. Each piece is overlapping half of the other one. By making them overlap each other, you get a closed armor, but that is also flexible. If an arrow hits this straight, it can't get through. And even if it hits from the side, it gets stuck between these plates. This one is made for humans, to pre prevent humans from getting hurt, but there are larger ones which were obviously used for horses. The infantry relied upon their shields as their protection, using a centuries-old design. These Egyptian shields show the construction using wood covered with leopard hide. Those used on the battlefield would have been similar in design, but less extravagant. This is a replica of an ancient Egyptian shield. Again, the original dates to the period of the New Kingdom. It's made of wood overlaid with leather. And you can see by the size, it's, it's superbly designed to actually protect the upper part of your body. The shield is big enough to shield me and maybe one other person from incoming arrows or from spears or blows from axes. It's also large enough to kneel behind. Imagine facing the incoming Egyptian infantry. They have a wall of shields like this, they will be impenetrable to your arrows and when you're at close quarters to your swords and battle axes. Ramses II demanded the best weapon technology available for his troops, but he was up against great competition. Weapons such as the Kapesh were particularly deadly. Its curved shape derived originally from a farming sickle used to cut crops. Although it had humble origins, the Kapesh was in fact an extremely effective and versatile weapon, with the cutting edge on the outside of the curve. This is a straight-edged sword, probably been brought in by mercenaries, based on a Greek design, really. The Romans also used swords similar to this, and they were used throughout Europe. Their skill was far superior to ours in a lot of respects, and we have definitely lost some of the technology, and we're actually now rediscovering it. These 3,000-year-old swords are the type to have been favored by Ramses II. They're called European straight swords and are tapered to a point with the center of gravity at the back. Extremely lightweight, they could be used by the average infantryman for fencing. Their slashing power made them a deadly weapon. The Hittites and other enemies of the Egyptians favored a straight sword. It's a good thrusting sword, but in open combat, it can still be used to slash. So it still has a cutting capacity. It's a dual purpose weapon. The Egyptians favored the Kopesh. It has this curved blade. And the thing about curved blades is, as they lay on the flesh, they naturally impart a slicing motion. They're technically more efficient at the cut. I've looked at these on the wall carvings for years and always thought they were rather primitive, like a sickle. They've just picked up an agricultural tool. It was a, a primitive, ungainly, ugly weapon. But this fine reproduction tells me it's a really beautifully designed weapon. In fact, it's almost perfectly designed because it has every function. I can still thrust with it because the curve is so created that the thrusting point is a direct line from my shoulder and it's also got this little hook, so I can get in, I can hook an enemy shield, bring it down and jab him in the face, and if that hasn't done it, slash open his jaw. I 
I think this would be my weapon of choice. Ramses II knew he had to have the best swords and developed a range to include the short straight sword and the longer Egyptian blades. These formed a major component in the Egyptian infantry arsenal. But there was another even more highly prized and technologically advanced weapon in the ancient arms race. The lethal composite bow. In the 12th century,